In the last video we introduced this equation AV equals lambda V which is a strange equation so for each so A is some fixed matrix for each lambda we can think of this as a system of simultaneous equations for V or for the components of V but the question is for which lambdas does this equation have a non-trivial solution in other words a non-zero solution V so for which lambda and we're going to allow complex lambdas as we'll see we'll see why soon so for which lambda does a v equals lambda v have a solution v that's not zero all right because zero is always a solution we don't care about that one so let me state the theorem A V equals lambda V has a non-zero solution if and only if uh, lambda is a root of the so-called characteristic polynomial of A. So the characteristic polynomial of A is a polynomial, and it's this polynomial. It's debt of A minus T times the identity equals zero. So T here is just a dummy variable. It's just this is just a, a variable that we've introduced. It's got nothing to do with V or its components. It's not a coordinate in, in Rn. It's just a variable, and so this this guy here is a polynomial in T. This whole expression is a polynomial in T. It's a polynomial of degree. In other words, the highest term, T to the something, is uh, degree N, where A is an N by N matrix. Um, let's see why that is. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do some examples and then prove the theorem. The proof is not hard, the proof is, is just a couple of lines, uh, but somehow the hard bit is getting your head around the statement and, and somehow what this characteristic polynomial is, I think. So let's do the example a equals 2 minus 1 1 0 that we uh, started with last time and let's check that 1 is indeed an eigenvalue from this theorem so um, first we do a minus t times the identity that means 2 minus 1 1 0 minus t times the identity in other words you stick t's on the diagonal instead of 1's so if we subtract this off this, we get 2 minus t minus 1, 1, and minus t. So in other words, we've subtracted t off every diagonal entry in A. That's what this A minus t i means. Now we take the determinant of this matrix. So that's 2 minus t times minus t. Minus, minus 1 times 1, so that's plus 1. So multiplying this whole thing out, we get t squared minus 2t plus 1. And the solutions, or the roots, of this quadratic are... And minus b, so that's 2, plus or minus square root of b squared, that's 4, minus 4ac, four that's 4 times 1 times 1, over 2 times a, and a is 1. So this is, uh, overall, if we simplify this, this is just 1. Right, so the bit inside the square root, the discriminant of this quadratic, is 0, 
So this is a double root. In other words, there's just one root and it's kind of counter with multiplicity two. And it's one. So we see that the only eigenvalue of this matrix is one. If we picked any other number, we wouldn't have been able to find a non-zero eigenvector. So I don't know if you had this experience at school, but a lot of people in my class used to seem to think that quadratic equations were completely pointless. Like, why do we study quadratic equations? I'm never going to need this formula in my life. Well, you're going to become increasingly grateful for this formula for solving quadratics because you can see here why this polynomial has degree n, right? t, the variable t, occurs on the diagonal in every entry. So we're going to get a factor of t to the n by multiplying all, all those entries together in the, in the determinant. So the determinant is a polynomial of degree n. So for a 2 by 2 matrix, that's degree 2. That's a quadratic. And you know how to solve quadratics because of this amazing formula for the solution of quadratics. Like minus b plus or minus root b squared minus 4ac over, over 2a. For 3 by 3, the determinant's going to be a cubic equation instead of a quadratic. You don't possibly have never seen the formula. There is a formula for cubics. It's a lot worse than this. If you have a 4 by 4 matrix, you've now got a quartic. Again, there is a formula, but I don't think I've ever seen it written down. It's that bad. And if you have a matrix of size 5 or bigger, there's actually no formula. There's provably no formula in terms of things like square roots and whatnot for degree 5 polynomials. So, you know, quadratics, they're like the nicest, nicest things. That was a bit of a digression, sorry. I want to do one more example before we prove the theorem. Another 2 by 2 example. Uh, let's take a to be um, 0, minus 1, 1, 0. Um, so a minus t times the identity is minus t minus 1, 1, minus t. And again, you can see that these minus t's on the diagonal, that's going to give us a t squared in the determinant. It's actually t squared minus minus 1. So the roots, the possible eigenvalues, are 0 plus or minus square root of uh, b squared 0, then minus 4 over 2. In other words, plus or minus i. And this is why, even though our matrix may well be real, and everything in sight is a real number, when we take eigenvalues, we may well have to deal with complex numbers. We'll actually see the eigenvectors also turn out to be complex. So um, let's find the eigenvectors. I'll start a new page. So the eigenvectors, well, we've got to separate them into two cases. First, we'll do lambda equals i. Right, we fix lambda equals i. So our equation is, our eigenvector equation, a v equals lambda v becomes uh, 0 minus 1, 1, 0. That's a times x, y equals i, x, i, y. Now you see this is simultaneous equations, but there's going to be an i in the answer somewhere, right? So let's multiply this out. We're going to get minus y x equals i x i y. So the first equation tells us uh, minus y equals i x. So y equals minus i x. And the second equation is x equals i y, which actually follows from the first if you multiply by i. So you only need one of these two equations. And so your eigenvectors are those of the form x minus.
SIX. Okay, so those are the eigenvectors for lambda equals I. For lambda equals minus I, uh, We're going to do the same thing. But now stick a minus i on the right hand side. So the equation becomes minus y equals minus i x and uh, x equals minus i y. Again, the first equation implies the second, so we just keep the second, the first. Um, is y equals ix. So the eigenvectors are those of the form x i x. Okay, so you get eigenvectors for lambda equals i, eigenvectors for lambda equals minus i. Okay, let's go back and prove this theorem. So a v minus lambda v has a solution which is non-zero if and only if lambda is a solution of this polynomial equals zero. Okay. So let's suppose there exists a v not equal to zero, such that a v equals lambda v. That tells us, taking the lambda v onto the other side, that a minus lambda times the identity of v is zero. And that tells us, actually, a minus lambda i is not an invertible matrix, because if it were, you could multiply by its inverse and deduce that v were equal to zero. That tells us that debt a minus lambda i is zero because we proved a couple of videos ago that the matrix is invertible if and only if it's determined is non-zero. And actually that's an if and only if. Turns out this is also an if and only if, and this is also an if and only if, right? This is just a rephrasing of the equation. So you might like to think about this one. I'm not going to talk about this, but you might like to think about why this one is if and only if. So this proves the theorem because this is telling us lambda. If you substitute lambda equals t in the characteristic polynomial, then you get debt of a minus lambda i equals zero. 